Hi everyone. In today's lecture, we will have a short overview of antigens and antibodies. Let's start by differentiating our immunogens from our antigens. Our immunogens are macromolecules capable of triggering an adaptive immune response in an immunocompetent individual. In other words, an immunogen is something that activates the immune system. Meanwhile, antigens are a type of immunogen. These are substances that react with an antibody or sensitized T cell but may not be able to evoke an immune response. So all antigens react with antibodies but not all of them may evoke an immune response. This means that not all antigens are immunogens but all immunogens are antigens. What makes something immunogenic? There are a few factors that contribute to an antigen's immunogenicity. First is its macromolecular size. For a substance to be recognized by the immune system, it has to be at least 10,000 Daltons. Now Daltons is just the unit of measure that we use for molecular weight. The most active immunogens are typically over 100,000 Daltons. Next is the foreignness of the antigen to the host. Typically, the more distant the source of the antigen is from the host, the more immunogenic it is. So for example, if we have an antigen from a bacteria and an antigen from a chimpanzee, the antigen from the bacteria would be more immunogenic in a human host. Next, we have the chemical composition and molecular complexity of the substance. Most immunogens are proteins and polysaccharides. Now, proteins are more immunogenic than our polysaccharides because they have a more complex structure. Proteins are usually made up a variety of amino acids, and they also have secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary arrangements. Meanwhile, our polysaccharides are usually just simple chains of repeating monosaccharides. Next is the ability to be processed and presented with an MHC molecule. In order for our antigen to be recognized by the immune system, it has to be combined with MHC molecules and presented to the variety of cells in our immune system. Let's take a look at some terms that we will usually encounter when studying antigens in immunology. First is epitopes. This is the part of the immune gen or antigen that is recognized by the immune system. Next, we have haptins which is a type of antigen that needs a carrier to elicit an immune response. Next, we have adjuvants. These are substances administered with an immunogen that increases the immune response against the substance. Usually, we find adjuvants in vaccines. Let's now talk about the different types of antigens. First, we have our autoantigens. These are antigens that belong to the host and do not provoke an immune response in an individual who is immunocompetent. Sometimes though, our own immune system can be overactive and react to our autoantigens. And in these cases, these are what we call autoimmune diseases. Next, we have our alloantigens. These are antigens from the member's host species and can elicit an immune response. A very good example of our alloantigens are the ABO antigens in our blood. Next, we have heteroantigens, and these are antigens from other species, such as plants, animals, and microorganisms. Usually, heteroantigens are much more immunogenic than alloantigens. Next, we have heterophile or heterophil antigens. These are antigens from unrelated species that cross-react due to identical or closely related structures. An example of these is rheumatoid fever in which there is cross-reactivity between streptococcus antigens and heart tissue antigens. In this condition, the immune system confuses heart tissue for the bacteria because of their similarity in structure. It thereby attacks the heart, which can lead to permanent damage or even death. Next, let's discuss about antibodies. Antibodies, or immunoglobulins, are glycoproteins produced by B lymphocytes. They are considered to be the main humoral element of the adaptive immune response. 
They play an essential role in antigen recognition and in biological activities related to immune response, such as your opsonization and your complement activation. Let's now talk about the different parts of the antibody. In this figure, you can see the characteristic Y shape of a monomer antibody. Our antibodies are tetrapeptides. This means that they are composed of four protein chains. In the case of our antibody, it is composed of four glycoprotein chains. Two of these chains are called light chains, and these are the smaller of the four chains. Here they are shown in light blue. The bigger chains are called our heavy chains. Here they are shown in dark blue. Each chain has a variable region and a constant region. The variable regions for each chain are found at the ends of the Y-shaped arms of your antibody. Now the variable region is responsible for attachment to the certain epitope that the antibody is specific for. And the variable region is different from antibody to antibody. Looking at the antibody as a whole, it is composed of three distinct regions. First, you have the FAB region. FAB stands for fragment antigen binding. This fragment is responsible for attaching to the certain epitope that the antibody is specific for. Next, we have the hinge region. This region is composed of a variety of sulfide bonds and is very flexible. This allows the antibody to change its shape to better attach to the antigen. Lastly, we have the FC region. Here, FC stands for fragment crystallizable. Now, this region is the effector region of your protein, which means it is responsible for our complement and FC receptor binding in the case of opsonization. There are five types of immunoglobulins or antibodies. Each of them is distinguished by the type of heavy chain that they have. First, we have our IgG, which has the gamma heavy chain, IgM, which has a mu chain, IgA, which has the alpha chain, IgD, which has the delta chain, and IgE, which has the epsilon chain. In this table, you can see the different formations or the different structures of each type of immunoglobulin and a rundown of their different functions, but we will discuss them in turn. First, let's talk about IgG. IgG is a very small antibody. This means that they can pass through the placental barrier. And because of this, IgG is the immunoglobulin that provides immunity for newborns. And it is the only antibody that can cross the placenta. The main functions of your IgG are for fixing complement, coating antigens for enhanced phagocytosis, in other words, opsonization. It can also neutralize toxins and viruses and participate in agglutination and precipitation reactions. We have four different subclasses of IgG, mainly IgG1, IgG2, IgG3, and IgG4. All of them differ in their respective hinge region. Now, IgG1 is the most abundant immunoglobulin, and it is very good at initiating phagocytosis. IgG2 is the only immunoglobulin G that is not able to cross the placenta. Meanwhile, IgG3 is the most efficient at binding at the complement. It's also very good at initiating phagocytosis. Then we have IgG4, which is the least abundant IgG. The IgGs are arranged in terms of their abundance in the circulation, IgG1 being the most abundant and IgG4 being the least abundant. IgG1 and IgG3 usually respond to protein antigens. Meanwhile, IgG2 and IgG4 mainly respond to polysaccharide antigens. Next, let's talk about IgM. IgM is composed of five monomeric subunits that are held together by a J-chain or the joining chain. Here you have an example of an IgM. You can see here the five individual subunits which are held together by the J-chain here in the middle. IgM is a very large antibody, and because of its structure, it also has the most antigen binding sites for any antibody. In this case, it has 10 antibody binding sites. Because of this, 
it functions in complement fixation as the most effective antibody. It can also be responsible for agglutination, opsonization, and toxin neutralization. IgM is what we call a primary response antibody because it is the first to appear after antigenic stimulation. So when we test for antibodies, a high level of IgM indicates that the patient has an ongoing infection. Next we have our IgA. IgA mainly functions as an anti-inflammatory agent. It is able to downregulate IgG-mediated phagocytosis, chemotaxis, bactericidal activity, and cytokine release. IgA also functions in preventing mucosal penetration of pathogens. The specific IgA that is responsible for this is called your secretory IgA. And this is just your IgA that has a secretory component attached to it. Your IgA can occur as a monomer or a dimer as you can see in this figure. When we say a dimer, it is composed of two subunits. There are also two subclasses of IgA, mainly IgA1, which is found in serum, and IgA2, which is the only antibody to be found on mucosal surfaces. This means that IgA2 is the antibody responsible for mucosal immunity. Next, we have IgD. Scientists aren't really sure what the true function of IgD is but they hypothesize that they may play a role in regulating B-cell maturation and differentiation. The reason for this being that the only site in the human body where you can find IgD is on the surface of B-cells. Lastly, we have IgE. This is the least abundant immunoglobulin and for good reason. The main function of IgE is that it has the ability to activate mast cells and basophils. It is also a very strong trigger for allergenic response. One important function of your IgE is that it aids in the response against parasites. Now, because parasites are very large organisms, the human body needs a lot of immune cells in order to combat it. And here, IgE is responsible for attracting a lot of immune cells and WBCs whenever it encounters a parasite. If you wanted to read more about the things we discuss in this lecture, you can refer to these references on the screen. So thank you very much for listening, and we hope to see you in the next video.